So with that, I introduce Dr. Safi Kaskas to talk about justice from an Islamic perspective. Uh, in between, I will share the formula for the justice versus. There are about 18 to 19 justice versus. There is a definite formula embedded in those verses, which I will share. Uh, Dr. Kaskas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Justice. What is justice or adil as it's known in Arabic according to the Quran and the Sunnah? Justice generally means equality in the sense of equ equating one thing with another. So if I want to be just, I will treat you the way I like to be treated. It also means putting things logically in their right place. Meaning if I am thinking about God versus myself, it is just to consider him my creator and the object of my worship. In the abstract sense, it could mean equality before the law. The belief, the believers are indeed brothers, the Quran says in Surah 49 verse 10. When used in the sense of distributive justice, it is expressed in the concept of qist or equity, mizan or scale, and taqweem or straightening. The notion of balance is expressed in the, in the word ta'adul, evenness, and the notion of moderation in the word wasat. Justice is concerned with both an inward quality of the soul and an outward quality of virtue. We have to be just to ourselves and with everything else and everyone else around us. It is common sense to say that if we are to talk about justice, we will also have to talk about injustice. In the Quran, the most damaging to human beings is when one is unjust to himself when denying God. The seven commands of justice in Islam. Anyone who has studied Islam will know very well that the faith places an extreme emphasis on the importance of being just. This emphasis on justice include ruling pertaining to families, communities, and nations as a whole. I've compiled, I've compiled a short list of seven direct and clear command of justice taken from both the Quran and the Sunnah for the benefit of all. First one, do not favor anyone about, above the truth. Believers, Quran says, Uphold justice and bear witness to God, even if that witness is against yourself, your parents, and your close relatives. Whether a person is rich or poor, God can best take care of both. Refrain from following your own desires so that you do, you do not act unjustly. If you distort the truth, God is fully aware of what you do. Quran 4, 135. It also says, Believers, be steadfast in your devotion to God, equitably bearing witness to the truth. Never let hatred for any people lead you to deviate from being just to them. Be just, for that is closer to being mindful of God. Always be mindful of God. God is well aware of what you do. Quran 5, 8. Number two, fulfill your trust. Verify Allah commands uh, verily, Allah commands you to render trust to whom they are due. Verily, Allah is ever hearing and, and seeing. Quran 4.58. Number three, judge fairly amongst others. So reconcile between them in justice and fairness. Verily, Allah loves those who are just. Quran 49.9. Number four. Be just toward your de dependents. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Verily, the most beloved of people to Allah on the day of resurrection and the nearest to him are seven kind of people. One of them is the just leader. This hadith is agreed upon, muttafaq alayhi in Arabic. He also said, the Prophet وسلم, said, Be just with your children. Be just with your sons. You'll find that in Abu Dawood. Number five, do not oppress others. Allah said in the Hadith Al-Qudsi, O oh my worshippers, I have forbidden oppression for myself 
and have made it forbidden among you. So do not oppress one another. That's in Sahih Muslim. Number six, do not harm innocent people. The Quran says, God does not forbid you from dealing kindly and equitably with those who did not fight you because of your faith and did not drive you out of your homes. God loves those who are equitable. Quran 68. Number seven, do not mock others. Believers, no man shall ridicule others for they may be better than them, nor shall any woman include ridicule other women. For they may be better than them, nor shall you slander one another, nor shall you call each other names. How bad it is to be called disobedient after accepting faith. Those who do not repent of this behavior are unjust. Quran Surah, Surah 49 verse 11. Now, instead of continuing to talk about justice theoretically, I am going to, to take this opportunity to address a practical example of Muslims in the, in the United States and the way they can turn this biased perception the majority of Americans have of Islam and Muslims and turn it around into one with justice for them, for other Americans and for the role of religion in America. The biased perception was not only because extreme Muslim re resorted to reactionary violence and claimed that this is Islamic, but because American Muslims do not necessarily think in terms of or understand the essence of Islam as it applies contextually to the contemporary scene. And if they do, they fail to explain it in ways that American can relate to or understand. Hence, once they properly explain what is Islam, they will be bringing justice to themselves and to other Americans who are now treating them in a biased way. Changing the perception of Islam in the West requires education about the common essence of all Abrahamic religions, as well as credible demonstration of this essence in practice. Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others must join in solidarity to rehabilitate the role of religion in the world in both essence and practice by providing a new paradigm of faith-based compassionate justice for public policy guidance. Indeed, indeed. The following four questions must be asked and answered. By the way, these four questions were posed uh, by Bob Crane, and I'm repeating the research that he did right now. Okay. Number one. Do faith and religion have a future? Number two, what is the core of the essence? Number three, what is the role of normative jurisprudence in the essence of Islam? Number four, what is the basis of political legit legitimacy? Let's start with do faith and religion have a future? In a world that is growing more secular every day, more people ask whether there is a future for faith and religion. One should distinguish between the two. Faith is belief in the unseen, in transcendent reality, in the ghayb, what is beyond our senses. This is part of a human nature and has provided purpose to human life since the first appearance of sentient life on earth. Faith is universal, eternal, and therefore has a future. Faith is the essence of religion. Religion is the response to faith in both individual and community life. Religion is the pursuit of knowledge about higher truth and the translation of knowledge into moral practice. There are many religious paths in the search for absolute truth, and there are many forms of practice, but all are designed for the same purpose, which is to worship the absolute in thought, word, and deed, whether we call it God, God, Dios or Allah. God tell us in Surah Al-Ma'idah 548, that's one of my favorite verses of the Quran, we have assigned to each of you a law, shir'ah, and a way of life, minhaj. If God had wanted, he could have made all of you a single community, but instead he is testing you by means of what he has revealed to you. So compete in doing what is good you will all return to God and he will clarify 
these matters about which you have differed. Surah 5, verse 48. Put differently, the future of faith and religion is the difference between essence and appearance. Many scholars distinguish between Christianity in the form of Christ's teachings as essence and Christendom as what one sees. Christianity is both a faith and an ideal system of practice, whereas Christendom may differ radically from Christianity itself. The same is true of Islam and Islamdom. Research suggested that the faith of Islam spread most rapidly when the Muslim empires were weak and slowly when they were strong. They spread most successfully in placing places like Indonesia, where there were no Muslim empires. Islam as a faith is spreading in America today precisely because it faces so, much, so many obstacles, just as it did 1450 years ago when the angel Gabriel first revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he was to be a prophet and messenger of God. Number, number two, what is the core of the essence? The future of Islam is up to God, but the future of Muslims is up to every person through one's observance of the first two essential in the universal Islamic value system. These two, known as taqwa and adl, are the core of the essence of Islam as a religion. Taqwa is loving, is loving awe of God in response to God's love of every person. Taqwa is also submission to God as the source of truth. And justice, adil, is love of compassionate justice as a framework for expre expressing our love for each other. As Cornwall West of Tikkun Alam puts it, justice is what love looks like in practice, in public. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, emphasized the importance of seeking truth and justice, but he posited the motivation for the search in the constant Quranic emphasis on love. As developed in Dr. Crane's book published in January 2010, The Natural Law of Compassionate Justice, an Islamic Perspective. A favorite prayer of Prophet Muhammad and of Imam Ali and of millions of Muslims ever afterward was, O oh God, I ask you for your love and for the love of those who love you, and for the love of everything that can bring me closer to your love. The Quran uses several different terms for various nuances of love. For example, in Surah Maryam, 1996, God uses the term with the. The merciful to all will give love to those who believe and do righteous deeds, i.e. bestow on them his love and endow them with the capability to love his creation, as well as cause them to be loved by their fellow man. Islam is known as a religion of peace, salam, which comes from submission to the only being worthy of a human submission, namely Allah. In classical Islamic thought, as developed from the 10th through the 13th century, peace as the essence of Islam results from justice. And justice is merely the expression of truth and love in a communal context. Beautifully said. The most Beautifully profound, said. Thank you. The most profound verse in the Quran as a source of faith-based justice in Surah Al-An'am 6.115, the message of your lords is completed and perfected in truth and in justice. This teaches that justice is an expression of truth and that the truth originates in the transcendent order of reality. Indeed, from the being of God, not in man-made law. Perhaps the second most profound verse in Surah, is Surah al shura 42.17, which emphasizes the concept of balance, known as mizan. This is central to all, all classical Islamic thought in every aspect of both personal and social life. 
It is God who has bestowed revelation from on high, setting forth the truth and thus giving man a balance wherewith to weigh right and wrong. This verse of the Quran teaches the divine revelation through the various prophets in human history is considered to be a balance, an instrument placed by God in our hands by which we can weigh all issues of conscience. A third profound teaching of the Quran is the importance and power of, of power of choice, of which the most important instance is freedom of religion and the freedom to interpret divine guidance in the practice of justice. The concept of choice is central because without freedom to choose, neither balance nor justice would have any meaning. The power to choose between good and bad is the greatest gift from the creator to the created, but it's also a profound test for every person, every community and nation, every civilization and humanity itself. The Quran emphasizes the importance of the basic power to choose between the pursuit of transcendent justice and the pursuit of material power as an ultimate goal in life. The balance to be maintained in every civilization as in embodied in every world religion is among order, justice, and freedom. This paradigm of balance teaches that order, justice, and freedom are interdependent. When freedom is construed to be independent of justice, there can be no justice and the result will be anarchy. When order is thought to be possible without justice, there will be no order because injustice is the principal cause of this order. When justice is thought to be possible without order and freedom, then the pursuit of order, justice and freedom are snares of the ignorant. A key to traditionalist American thought based on the spiritually based Scottish enlightenment, which we were talking about a minute ago, which was the opposite of the secularist enlightenment in Europe is the distinction now almost forgotten between freedom and liberty. This fundamental distinction in thought, symbols, and action is portrayed in David Hackett Fisher's monumental 851 pages, Home, Liberty, and Freedom, a visual history of America's founding ideas, Oxford University Press, 2005. In classical or traditionalist American thought, freedom implies positive action to pursue higher values as the essence of justice, as distinct from mere liberty, which refers negatively to rejection of restraints on freedom of action. The preamble of the American constitution lists and prioritizes five purposes. Justice come first, followed by domestic order, the common defense and prosperity. And lastly come liberty, which is merely the result of the first four. Without consensus on the proper nature of order and of justice and freedom as essential part of a single whole rather than an independent, independ, as independent pursuits, no civilization can continue to exist. The twin roles of religion in all of its traditionalist manifestation, including the monotheistic and especially Islam are the spiritual well-being or happiness of every person and the maintenance of consensus on the responsibility and rights necessary to live in an ordered society. Students of comparative legal systems differ on whether there is an essence to any particular religion and to any given legal system, or whether each religion is an accumulation of a human practices and every legal system is a composite of accidentals developed in response to changing exigencies. Islam by far the best example of a religion that has very self-consciously developed a sense of its own essence and sharply distinguished this form, this from uh, any pre, uh, per, perverted interpretation and practice. Whereas in Christianity, the essence is considered to be love. In Islam, the essence is considered to be justice as a derivative of love. What is the role of normative jurisprudence in the essence of Islam? 
in Western positivist law, which by definition is entirely man-made, law exists only to the extent that it is that it is enforced. In Islam, if the law has to be enforced, it has failed because the purpose of Islamic law is primarily educational as a set of guidelines for action. What are these guidelines? Some of the best minds in human history developed this set of guidelines over a period of many centuries. These guidelines are known as maqasid al-sharia, or the ultimate purposes of the sharia, or as the kulliyat, or universal principle, or as the dururiyat, or essentials. Very briefly, these may be categorized as eight irreducible purposes about each of which a separate chapter has was written by Robert Crane in the unpublished book, Rehabilitating the Role of Religion in the World, laying a new foundation on faith-based compassionate justice, most of which was posted in the Ezeen, the American Muslim, on May 30 through June 7 of 2009. The first is Haq al din the right to freedom of religion. The second is haqq al-nafs. These are maqasid al-sharia, the essentials of maqasid al-sharia. The second is haqq al-nafs, respect for the human person and human life. The third is haqq al-nasl, respect for marriage and human community. Fourth is haqq al-mahd, respect for the physical environment. Fifth is haqq al-mal, respect for the universal right to own and to economic opportunity and ownership of productive pro uh, uh, profit. Yeah. Yes. Number six, haq al hurriya respect for the universal right of self-determination or political freedom. Number seven, haq al karama respect for human dignity, especially gender equity. Eight, and haq al-ilm, respect for the rights to free speech, publication, and association, and to seek knowledge in every shape and form. I'm almost done, bear with me. Yes, yes. These norms or, guide or guidelines constitute the essence of Islamic jurisprudence. They provide a sophisticated methodology for understanding the Quran and evaluating the ahadith sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, so that the rules and regulations or ahkam can be applied justly according to their purposes. The Quran teaches in Surah Al-Isra 1770, We have honored the children of Adam. As a consequence of being honored by God, we all deserve to have human rights, regardless of our choice of religion or lack of such choice. The ability of a state to provide and guarantee these rights to its citizen is the only justification for the state's existence. In that, friends, you are listening to this, the common sense Islam, the Islamic values. Today we are talking about value number seven, justice of the 17 values we're talking about. These values contribute to the common goodness of all societies. And these are the Islamic values, which are universal values indeed. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Kaskas. And I appreciate you saying the seven commandments, four yes. questions, and the maqasid of Sharia. Sharia. Uh, please continue. I have one more point. Human rights. Yes. The basis for political legitimacy. In other words, without a human right, there is no political legitimacy to any system, regardless what they're called. One of the great blessings that God bestowed upon us is the ability to recognize where we are and to wonder about why we are here and where we are going. The second great blessing is the ability to choose in reaching answers. The third great blessing was divine revelation sent to help guide us to him, culminating in the Quran. These privileges given to all human beings can only be translated in today's world as basic human right, as divine in the Quran in general, and later through maqasid al-sharia. The verse cited above on honoring the children of Adam, 
is manifested in the first 10 amendments of the American Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights, and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 10, 1948. As indicated in Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, verses 96 and 97, quoted above, these God-given rights are universal. Hence, the primary role of government is to ensure and secure every citizen's ability to enjoy these God-given human rights. In fact, no human being should be held responsible for his deeds on earth in the day of judgment in the absence of these basic rights so necessary for our individual ability to choose freely between the guidance sent to us from God and all other choices. Lack of freedom generally created, generally created oppressive circumstances, especially fear, and often limit our ability to choose and can divert our choices toward oh. issues such as best basic survival. Absence of basic human rights and lack of freedom will create oppressive circumstances similar to those that led the second Khalifa Omar to, to exempt a thief from being punished because the society did not provide the right opportunity to earn an honest living and, freed, and feed oneself and one's family. Any government, especially one that claims to follow the teachings of the Quran, that fails to ensure the citizens these basic rights, thereby loses its legitimacy, its reason to exist. The last point we have here is number five. Can Muslim change the perception of Islam through a grand strategy of paradigm management? Absolutely. The perception, the perception of Islam in America can be changed only if Muslims think big through what we might call paradigm management and only if the paradigm to be managed is American. Policy making in America consists of balancing special interests in the pursuit of power. But this balancing takes place in pursuit of agendas formed largely in the think tanks and in the media. These agendas in turn are, sharp, are shaped by paradigms formed, are shaped by paradigms formed primarily in academia. Muslims usually start at the wrong end of the policy process, especially by lobbying against something after the policies have been set and can no longer be changed. If anything, this shows how little they knew the system. We want to change that. The two opposite poles of paradigmic management are power and justice. The neocons exemplify the power paradigm, whereby everything is measured in terms of the unilateral imposition of American power, mainly military, to prevent chaos in, the, chaos in the world. This approach is based on fear and on reaction to real or perceived threats to global stability. A clear example of this is the war on terror and the failed occupation of Afghanistan. The opposite paradigm is justice. If Muslims can present it as the best alternative to the power paradigm to replace wars and to bring productive peace that can be in the best interest of the United States and the world and prove that peace is more profitable to the average American then peace and Muslims will have a chance. Muslims can change the perception of Islam in the United States and indeed of all religions only by rehabilitating the essence and practice of religion, not as the cause of injustice, but as the only cure. In politics, visionary leaders can overcome the seemingly insurmountable obstacles and barriers of special interest only if and to the extent that Muslims, Christian, and Jews cooperate in solidarity to turn the essential vision of all religion into reality, inshallah. <coughs> Inshallah. Thank you so very much. I'm going to share a few things and then we'll have a conversation with our fellow friends. Uh, 
you mentioned about the paradigm management changing the perceptions of Muslims. And uh, it is on our part that we have failed. Somehow, some Muslims don't want to deal with the people who uh, accuse us, who false, who tell us wrong things, who condemn us. And that doesn't work. We have to engage with them. There is a power of engagement. I'll give you two examples. Sean Hannity on Fox News was bashing Quran four years before every night. When I sat down with him with a copy of the Quran and shared with him, for example, he says, kill the infidels wherever you find them. And I said, okay, take that verse. We went to that verse. And this is the formula I showed him. If the bad guys pull over in a truck in front of your house, you tell them to back off. They are, they are carrying the guns to shoot you. You tell them to back off. If the bad guys keep coming at you, you tell them still back off. But if they jump on you and want to throw you out of your own home, your own space, you get your act own action and start shooting. Exactly. You chase them. Yes. And when they run and hide behind the bushes, you find them and you are ready to shoot them. You can do that. That's what most Americans do. That's what justice is about. But there is something more Islam has offered here. If those people regret, repent that I made a mistake, I will not do it. Quran tells you to make peace with them. And that is the most important part of the justice part of Islam. So I explained this to Hannity and I showed him some examples in the Quran, I gave him a copy of Muhammad Asad translation. And he, at that time, I didn't have your translation. It is about six years ago. We, we talked about the Quran on the stage with him. And after that, he has quit bashing Quran after that for a long time. And this is how we can change perceptions by engaging with them. But as uh, Dr. Kaskas, it is a very humiliating experience. They will tear you down. They will condemn you. They'll put, make you, they'll belittle you. If you can bear that out for a short period, then they will listen to you. And that's what happened with Hannity. I listened to him. And he said at one of the meetings, you know why I want to do what you asked me to do that is not bash the Quran? Because you are my only Muslim friend. You put up with me for four years. You did not argue with me, and I have not found any Muslim to do that. Now, because of that, I will not bash the Quran from now on, and he has not done that. So we can change the perceptions by engaging with them. We just cannot tell them to do it unless we engage with them. So um, your comments, and then we can uh, ask Bob Crane, Ibrahim Sayyid, and Abu Bakr, uh, Ibrahim, we have two Ibrahims. Uh, actually, I, I always use you as an example because you almost went and camped at Fox News and made sure all, for years you don't leave. Regardless what they tell you, how they insult you, how they try to belittle you, you just stay there. And uh, in fact, if 10 Muslims have done that in their 10 towns, we would have changed the image already. But they're not doing this. Uh, you know, various Muslims had various reactions to 9-11. Yes. Some, some hid away. They didn't want to be seen. Others went to the mosque and Islamic center seeking uh, protection in numbers, you know. And some of us did what you did. And I, I chose to do a Quran translation, for, for instance. Uh, I chose to educate rather than confront. Uh, I remember Bob Crane telling us, let's don't respond to Islamophobia. And he refused to respond to them directly. He said, leave them alone. Let's talk about what's positive in Islam. Let's don't be reactionaries. Do you remember that, do you remember that Bob? Oh, I certainly do. I've always thought that we're much more effective if we emphasize what Islam is, rather than get caught up in uh, 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 trying to defend against those who who uh, corrupted. Yes, indeed. 
Uh, did I miss Bob any any points when no, I No, you haven't you haven't missed anything <laughs> I've said in the last uh, 60 years yes. in hundreds of articles and several books you mm -hmm. haven't missed a thing. <laughs> I've never, uh, <laughs> brother I've never I want seen such I want, a good summary. <laughs> yes, actually I was praying that you'll be here today. I because I wanted you to know that your ideas are not dead and they're not buried in books. They're alive. Ideas like Ibn Rushd told us have wings. They mm -hmm. always go to those who appreciate them. And as you know, I appreciate your ideas a lot. So I use them every time I have a chance and I give you credit for using them. Well, I'm a long range global forecaster by profession, always have been for government and industry. And uh, I'm always hopeful uh, about the future if I can look far enough in, in the future. Uh, actually, I'm pessimistic, but uh, I, I like to come uh, across as optimistic because if we're not optimistic, then there's no choice but to be pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I agree with that, yes. Uh, if you want to make a change, we have to make a change. We just can't sit around and be defensive. As uh, Brother Kaka said, we have to take the step to change the perceptions and we can do it. But it, it has to be based on what I call the essence of all the world religions, which including the, the uh, uh, indigenous, which is, you know, my own Cherokee background, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is very Islamic but it's Islamic uh, in a way that has bothered a lot of Americans. Uh, President Theodore Roosevelt abolished the Cherokee religion and Cherokee self-government in 1905. Uh, and my great uncle, uh, Frank Bieber, uh, led a movement for two years thereafter all around the country, trying to organize the uh, First Nations to demand freedom of religion and, and and government. Uh, he failed. But uh, what I learned from all of this and concluded is that there, there are two types of justice. One is taught at Harvard Law School, uh, where I got a degree. Uh, uh, and according to that, they call it the uh, case method uh, law consists of following previous cases. Uh, in, in order to get a good grade at Harvard, you have to find previous cases that would support the, the current case you're looking at. Uh, and I said, but I always want to look at the principles involved. I, I really don't care what was decided 100 years ago. It's interesting. But what principles did they use? Uh, what principles should we use today? Uh, that was considered heresy. And whenever I asked about principles, they would tell me to shut up. Uh, you were at Harvard Law School. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, you're, you're talk, they, they like to talk about precedent, and you were talking about principles. Well, I was following the Quran. Yes. Tamat Kalimat Quranika Sitkan Wa'adlan. The word of your Lord <clears throat> is perfected. Um, uh, uh, in truth. In, in truth and injustice. Justice. You, yes. First you look for truth, yes. then you look for justice. Yes. And the way to look for truth is to be aware of Allah to begin with, Yes. Uh, and to study the scriptures, of, especially of Islam, but of other religions too. Um, yeah. uh, uh, and then there's another uh, quote, وَمِنْ مَا حَلَقْنَا أُمَّتُونْ يَخْتُونُ بِالْحَقِّ وَبِهِ يَا عَدِلُونَ yeah, which is uh, above, uh, among those people that we've created are those who uh, 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 are, are aware of truth and use it to promote justice. Yes. The, the, the concept that uh, law should not reflect what we have done in the past. Maybe it should reflect what we should do in the future. Yes. <laughs> but Indeed. everything that you have said summarizes everything that I've ever said. Alhamdulillah. Beautifully. Yes. Well, I'm glad to say, I'm glad to 
learn about it, Bob. I'm glad you wrote it. I'm glad Safi replicated it. And uh, as Safi said, your work is not buried, it is alive. Yes. Actually, well, I did not replicate it. I continued to use it and injected a lot of my own thoughts to it also. Indeed. You know? indeed. Well, see, you have incredible depth of knowledge Thank of the you. Quran. Yes, alhamdulillah. Uh, what, what I say makes sense within your framework. And then that's my conclusion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. We complement each other, brother. <laughs> well, I'm on this. Inshallah. I'm a little guy. I'm in same page with you guys. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Ibrahim Sayyid and Ibrahim Abu Bakr Ibrahim, if you want to share some comments about justice. Yes. Uh, well, uh, hello. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Who? Who? Which Ibrahim? Uh, this is Ibrahim Abu Bakr. Yes, Ibrahim go, Abu ahead. go ahead. And I'm go very ahead. honored and pleased to meet Dr. Kaskas and also Dr. Crane, who have a reputation of excellence in promoting not only justice, but Islam as well. Yes. Uh, regarding the paradigm of justice as enunciated in the Quran and very well explained by Dr. Kaskas, I just wanted to bring to your attention that Harvard Law School, one of the most prestigious institutions of its kind in the world, has posted a verse of the Quran at the entrance of its faculty library, describing the verse as one of the greatest expressions of justice in history. It's verse 135 of Surah Al-Nisa, the woman, yes. yes, has been posted at a wall facing the faculty's main entrance dedicated to the best phrases of articulating justice. Now you can refer, I'm not gonna uh, read the, the verse, but uh, it is uh, verse 135 of Surah Al-Nisa. Also the Supreme Court of the United States has some caricatures on uh, that very historical building. And one of the caricatures on there is a uh, depiction of Prophet Muhammad as one of the greatest lawgivers to have a, ever existed in history. And it includes others with Justinian and all the other people that are, uh, that are uh, associated with justice. Uh, justice can be seen as the exercise of reason and free will on the practice of judgment and responsibility. Human rights granted by Islam are not confined to citizens of any one state. They are to be enjoyed by Muslims as well as non-Muslims all over the world without any discrimination. Now, also I would like to bring to your attention here that uh, one of the first congressmen ever elected to the Congress of the United States, uh, Keith Ellison, took his oath of office on the Quran. And this Quran was, belonged to Thomas Jefferson, one of the founders of the nation of the United States. I just read this book, I'm holding it up here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. We're familiar with it, yes. Yes. I have actually gone to the uh, Library of Congress. Of a lot of the principles enunciated in the Constitution are very compatible with that of the Quran. And I just want to conclude by saying that the Fig Council of North America has issued a ruling that the principles enunciated in the Constitution of the United States are very compatible with Islam and justice. So this is, uh, you know, uh, it is, uh, they, they share no inherent contradictions. They actually embody the same universal ideals of justice, fairness, and equality. Uh, you know, this was the conclusion of the fatwa. Uh, uh, yes, Brother Abu Bakr, actually, yes. actually, uh, the Constitution of the United States is based on the Constitution of Medina. Absolutely. 
that the constitution of Medina has those not, values. Not just in theory, in fact. Yeah, in practice, in practice. <laughs> what, is, what is tragic, what is tragic is that our Muslim scholars all over the world, for some reason, uh, don't talk about the constitution of Medina because they are working in the service of systems who don't want equality to everybody, who don't encourage uh, equality between Muslims and non-Muslims, who don't want to accept non-Muslim as part of the Ummah, like, like the constitution of Medina said. Yes. So uh, I'm absolutely sure that Thomas Jefferson uh, read the constitution of Medina or was told about it and learned about the principles in it and this connection between uh, the divine uh, and the fact that we are a republic and not a, just a democracy, but a republic where yes. God is always in charge of everything, you know, right. comes from Islam. Indeed. Well, I just want well, to introduce you, uh, Ibrahim Abubakar. Uh, he was my original inspiration. He used to write at Dallas Morning News about Islam, and I used to read it. I'm talking about 20, 25 years ago. Then I started reading and writing and uh, he inspired me to write and uh, thanks to you, Abu Bakr. Now I'm writing every place. You're most welcome. And, and, and I appreciate the fact that you had confronted Shane Hannity and even persuaded him. Congratulations. <laughs> you. Not, not, not just him. You ought to hear his story with the, that woman, Gabrielle. <laughs> whatever her name is. And, uh, he, he didn't leave them alone at all. He was after each one of them. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, I was engaged with both of them, Pamela Giller, uh, Bridget Gabriel, and uh, several of them. And I think they have an agenda. That's why they do it. But somehow they're amenable to some reason and logic. Uh, the, the intensity of their head kind of reduces when you give them reason and logic. Well, I, I think they would like to impose their views. I, I won't comment on what their views are, but they would like to impose them. Uh, and, and this, uh, I think, is one of the greatest splits uh, in the United States right now. Uh, whether uh, truth or whatever one, one values uh, uh, can arise in a confederal system rather than a centralized system. Now, Thomas Jefferson uh, was very familiar with the Iroquois Confederation. He in, invited their principal religious leader to Monticello three times, to the White House a couple of times. And that's where he learned the idea of confederalism, which did not exist in Europe uh, at that time. Uh, and the, the Iroquois and the Cherokees uh, formed their own confederation. The Cherokees, uh, according to the traditionalists, not the one supported by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the traditionalists like myself, uh, uh, are uh, thoroughly aware of the tradition that the Cherokee religion came in the form of a book uh, uh, on a great fleet of ships, which landed in the, an, an island where it never got cold. We're not supposed to interpret that, but uh, I interpreted it. That means the Caribbean. Uh, and that great uh, 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 flotilla of ships was sent by uh, Emir Abu Bakr, who was head of the Mali Empire uh, in 1310, 1312, uh, two great fleets of ships to bring Islam and specifically the Quran to the peoples of America. And 10 years later, the Aztec Empire started suddenly uh, as a confederation. Uh, that was a new idea there too. They borrowed that from uh, uh, directly from the Mali Empire. And the Cherokees, uh, uh, they, they were attacked by the, well, it's, it's a long story. They, they, they ended up in uh, looking for the book uh, in the East and they ended up in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. No. Uh, and since they had a confederation and the Iroquois had a confederation, they joined in a grand confederation. And this fascinated Thomas Jefferson. So that's why uh, he basically started 
a, a system of thought that based on distributive power on the confederation as distinct from Alexander Hamilton, who said you have to have a single bank to control everything, the exact opposite. This split between, between confederalism uh, uh, and, and I would call it the, the, the system uh, certainly best illustrated in, in Medina by the Prophet Muhammad so it was Adam. Um, that is a, a basic direction uh, for America and it comes from Islam. Uh, and I think we Muslims should make it clear uh, that uh, we support this founding principle of confederalism. Uh, imperial powers want to create artificial states. They destroy all the, the organic nations that they conquered. And then the organic nations uh, refuse to be destroyed and some of them become terrorists. We say, no, you got to be quiet. We have these new states and, and they have to be totalitarian in order to maintain control and they can't. So then they inv invite uh, military power from the Europeans and the United States. Uh, uh, th this is a basic split which will determine the future, not only of America, but of the entire world. Yes. Uh, yes. And the, the major force against any kind of concentrated power, totalitarianism, uh, you know, Soviet, Russian, uh, Chinese communist, the major force to protect uh, uh, truth and justice is Islam. And we have to be proud of that, but we have to recognize that every other religion has the same emphasis, but they have a split too. It's like Chris, uh, Christianity and Christendom, Islam, Islamdom, uh, all religions uh, are, are corrupted from within. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, Safi and, and Mike Raus and, and well, all of you here, uh, we have a mission to bring out uh, what uh, Allah has revealed in all of the religions, not just in Islam. We have to work together with people in other religions who have the same understanding. And forget about all those Islamophobes, uh, Judeophobes, Judeo whatever. Uh, uh, that distracts us. It popularizes what they th think, as a matter of fact, even to address it. Uh, uh, we always have to take a, a productive, positive approach rooted in the Quran. And, and Safi, I think, is, well, I don't know. I personally think he's the greatest Quranic scholar uh, maybe in history. <laughs> I agree with <laughs> I you. Would argue that. Yeah. <laughs> don't believe that. I don't believe it. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But uh, not true. <laughs> Uh, well, Abby, you, you gotta you get his, admirers at any rate. <laughs> Abby, you gotta get his book. Oh, by, South what it is. by Dr. Kaskas. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, of course. This right. is the second book. The first book yes. is a plain translation of the Quran. It's the, called the, the comparison, Quran, right? Contemporary understanding. That's the one right there. Yeah. And yeah. The second the book. Amazon? No, nobody yeah, has compared book. the two scriptures uh, uh, line yeah, the, by line. The second book is the Quran with the references to the Bible. Anytime yeah. we found a verse in the Bible that has a similar meaning to a verse in the Quran, we put it as a reference. So right. we stopped about 3,500 verses. Yeah, and, uh, All and these think... verses from the Bible have similar meaning in the Quran. Yeah, you know? yeah. And well, you, could, you, you could do the same thing for Buddhism. Yes. But I'm doing it now for the Tanakh. Yeah, you remember, you remember uh, in 1982, I was asked to uh, found a monastery for Native American religions in Colorado. A yes. Canadian billionaire funded it. And uh, so I arrived and two Buddhist monks from Dharmasala uh, had just arrived and uh, they had to go into the little local town to get supplies. So the, the head of this village uh, asked me to entertain him for five minutes. And I, I said, uh, so I told them, look, we have five minutes. Can you explain to me everything important about Buddhism? And they laughed and they said, we don't need five minutes to explain that. First, we have uh, uh, Hinayana Buddhism, which teaches you to avoid becoming addicted to the physical world. And once you've done that fairly well, we have 
Mahayana Buddhism, at which level you will be aware of, and we don't have a name for it, you call it God. Uh, you, uh, any name restricts the meaning. You can't restrict the unlimited. Uh, so we don't have a name, but uh, you, you call it God. Uh, and he said, once we are aware of Allah, our one great hope in life is to bring compassionate justice to every person and everything. And I said, mashallah, you have just summarized everything important about Islam in three minutes. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> brother, brother Abu Bakr, I have the box here. If you want me to sign it for you, just uh, send me your uh, email and I'll send you my, uh, and your mailing address and I will send you the information. Uh, Mike has everything. Mike has all the information. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kaskas. It's yeah. available on Amazon, right? It is available on Amazon, but to tell you the truth, we'd rather sell what we have because we have a quantity. And if we, if we sell through Amazon, hardly anything comes back to us. Oh, okay. I, I will be glad to get it from Mike and I will purchase it directly from you with a, yes. Yes. With a, a signature, which I'd be very proud of. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ibrahim Sahib, if you got Mike. some comment, we can uh, wrap it up in yeah. about two to Just three to four minutes. Small comment is that uh, the collapse of the Byzantine Empire during the rule of the Khulafai Rashidun was the people living in uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, they were not happy, they were persecuted. So they wanted uh, the Muslim uh, to conquer them and give them the justice and the uh, human rights and freedom of speech, all those things. So that was one of the reasons why uh, the Byzantine Empire collapsed. And it was a super war at that time. And this is very important. This is like a Dawa work. These things like uh, you know, justice and freedom of expression. Also, during the Mughal Empire, there was a ruler, his name was Jahangir. And uh, he is very famous for his justice. I can give a story, but I don't have time now. Sometime in the future. What I mean is the strength of Islam is justice. And that was the topic we discussed today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother Kaskas, you want to summarize in two or three minutes before we wrap it up? And you will find this video at, uh, you have to just type in youtube.com and just type it Muslims together and you will find the video. Abu uh, Abu you got a yeah, Brother Abu Bakr has something to say. Uh, uh, with all due respect to uh, Dr. Bob Crane and Brother Seth. Dr. Safi Kaskas, I just, I, I'm very glad uh, you elucidated this concept so well, uh, even referencing the, con uh, the constitution of Medina. Uh, this brings me to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his farewell, farewell sermon, informed yes. the believers relating to this matter. All mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over a black, nor does a black have any superiority over the white, except by piety and good action. Every Muslim is a brother to every other Muslim. And as Dr. Kaskas explained, Muslims constitute one brotherhood. But we have a responsibility as an ummah to the rest of the world. Since the religion of Islam is addressed to all of mankind, not only to Muslims. Absolutely. I conclude with that. Indeed, yes. indeed. 1144 years later, the same was put in the Declaration of India's Independence that we all men are equal, that we believe in the, uh, the truth. Michael, let me conclude with the dua because time is running short and I have some people coming now. Okay. Thank Dear you. Lord, thank you for bringing us together and for the privilege you granted me to address 
these brothers uh, today. God, please grant us peace and serenity and help us to overcome those who are suffering. Give them patience and perseverance. Please eliminate this virus and heal those who are sick. Glory to you, O Allah, and praise. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship but you. I seek your forgiveness and repent to you. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, brother. Amen. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fi aman Allah. Fi aman Allah. Masalama. Masalama. Bye, Mike. I'll be contacting you, okay? Sounds good.